Welcome to the Marvel Cinematic University Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Canton III, and we are continuing our coverage of the Disney Plus series Loki Season 2, Episode 4, The Heart of the TVA. Oh, the heart might be a little broken right now. We'll get into it, but let's get into the panel first. The super producer, Jake Christie, is with us. Jake, how are you? I'm doing well. You know, uh, I'm happy to talk about this. Happy to have this panel. Yes, yes, we have a wonderful panel. We have friends of the show, returning guests. First, our pal Anthony Mays is back from his one episode absence. Mays, how you doing, bro? I'm doing good. I'm powered up, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, he brought the sounds. This should be an interesting evening. And also our other friend of the show, uh, journalist, nerd journalist, call him a nerdalist. Uh, Hunter Radisi. Hunter, how you doing, bro? I'm doing great, and I'm going to put Nerdalist in my bio now. That was an incredible... Did you just come up with that on the spot? Yeah, you know, I've been kind of thinking about when to use that. I was going to use mm. it last week. Oh, you had it in the uh, tank. other guests, and yeah. And I said, I'm honored. Right, I'm gonna, I'll, use it this, I'll use it this time. That so, beats out the previous thing yeah. where I used to introduce you as the pride of Western New York, but I think that... I mean, no, I'm okay both. with that, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, but before we begin, I know the TVA is in a little bit of disarray, but you know what's not in disarray? The Patreon of Marvel Cinematic University, as we give our bonus content, $3 to get into the Discord, $8 for Avenger level, and you get an opportunity to do a subscriber mailbag with us, Jake and I will be (laughs) releasing (laughs) Kate of the Furious. Uh, <laughs> sometime either this weekend or next week as we, we will be recording that soon and we have a subscriber mailbag that we always do so check that out and of course appreciate everybody for supporting guys oh my goodness we are four episodes through this season and I will say this not often lately in phase four and now phase five in the MCU that I've had an opportunity to say the words holy shit And I said, holy shit, at the end of this episode. But I want to kind of work our way back first, because as usual, Maze, you were not here last week. So I want to hit... I want to hit your the some of the text messages that you sent me last week oh, regarding man. the episode and horny miss minutes, everything that was going on with that. Give me your give me your rundown. Yeah, I'll be real brief about it. I thought the mm-hmm. World's Fair thing was really cool, as we've talked about in my previous appearances on this podcast the production design of loki is leaps and bounds ahead of everything else at this point and clearly they had a field day with designing this world's fair i loved all of that we got jonathan majors back he made some interesting acting choices with the stutter and everything else in the frederick Douglass hair but it was working for me for the most part and then man what the hell let me just wear out this button what was going on with that clock she was trying to get dick down so bad she wanted to be in a human body just so she could feel what that was like unbelievable did not see it coming and then this episode let's put it right back in your pants let's pretend like it didn't even happen let's put the thirst away and let's just move on and go back to being an operating system. It was distracting and mind blowing. And I gotta say I loved every second of it. Yeah. <laughs> Maze, I'm glad you and I are on the same page here. I'm I mean you're saying this, I'm like, this is not the if Maze didn't enjoy this idea, this is not oh, the Maze I know. <laughs> oh, I loved it. It caught me off guard, but it was definitely like I was just you know. AC says this episode made him say holy shit. I was saying holy shit at Miss Minutes last week. <laughs> that's, that's tremendous stuff, man. And and Hunter, you haven't been on, so you got to see all four of these episodes before any of us did. So I wanted to get your overlay of the series leading up to this one. How did, how have you felt about the first three? Oh man, I I mean I loved it. Um, that, that's part of why like you and I talked a little bit about like what episode I would try to come on for and, and schedule for. And this is the one I wanted to be on. I mean, I think that's obvious why now, because holy shit, right? Um, mm-hmm. And also, I feel like I get a chance to see everything twice before I talk about it, which is also really good because there's so many like bits and pieces that go on over the course of these four episodes that like, like there's so much happening. So it's so easy to miss little things. Uh, and it's been fun to like pick that up. 
um, and also see the world react to it. Like you guys were, were reacting to Miss Minutes last week. Imagine me quietly alone in my room at like 2 a.m. <laughs> binging the episodes before they disappear wow. from Disney's streaming service. Like, I don't understand what's happening with Miss Minutes. I felt so alone in that moment. You have no idea. It was it was it was a difficult thing to navigate um, by myself, and I'm glad that the world has caught up with me. Um, and I, I have no idea I have no idea where it's going either. I think that's the most exciting part about the way this ended. Is like I could I don't even know if I could theorize because I'm like I actually I genuinely I don't know like I don't know where it goes from here, and that's fine. It's such a perfect like it's almost like they put a whole season in four episodes, and now the rest of it is like a surprise. Like episode four connects to episode one so beautifully and it wraps everything up and it kind of feels like a season finale, but we still have a third of this season left and I'm just excited to see what sort of creative shenanigans they've got cooking. Cause who knows? Hunter, I'm glad that you mentioned that because one thing that Jake said in the discord last night was very similar to what you just said regarding this TVA issue that, you know, you always wonder in TV series how long they're going to stay with a certain plot. And as much as you can like the people in the TVA and be interested in the characters, it's like it's still just the TVA. So now that we're past that and we're into some grand new territory that we don't even know, it is very interesting to see how this goes on. But, Jake, I wanted you to kind of expound on that point and give your general uh, thoughts on the episode at the same time. Yeah, I, the point I was making was that I feel like once this episode started, if you, if you were to tell me that they weren't going to solve the loom problem until episode six, that would have felt like stalling because it felt like this was at a critical enough moment. They have Victor Timely there. There is no literal reason for these characters to not solve or have this come to a head now, right? The only reason it would wait till episode six is if you were to introduce new things, which is fine. But like, I just find it so much more interesting and narratively, narratively refreshing to let the the characters in the story direct the plot as opposed to the plot directing all that, right? And so I also think that one of the most interesting things I think you can do in a story like this is if you have, in the first four episodes, saying, like, this is the worst thing that can happen. This is the thing we need to prevent. This is the thing we need to prevent. This is the thing we need to prevent. Yes, the obvious thing is that they're going to try really hard, and in episode six, they prevent it. But I find I think it's, the most, it's a very brave and compelling and why we all say holy shit in our decision to be like, what if the decision is that the thing that we are saying, we're bolding and underlining cannot happen? What if we say, okay, it happens, and it happens episode four? So then what? I think that that puts us in a great position because I think so much with these Marvel shows, because they're based on comics and because, you know, we have so much inside information, et cetera, from nerdalists, et cetera, et cetera. To have something where you genuinely don't know where it's going to go is hard to do and i think that by like i didn't even consider the idea that they would actually just have it blow up and maybe obviously not literally kill all the characters but for all we know and so i don't think that that's just a brave narrative decision uh in the sphere we don't get it like i don't think anyone in even the biggest marvel fanboys won't say that marvel makes a ton of brave narrative decisions and i think that this is assuming that they take it to an interesting place i really think that this is i was genuinely surprised which doesn't happen often with mcu shows at this point I'm definitely with you there on that front. Maze, I wanted to get not only your general thoughts on the episode, but just kind of like the building to this crescendo that occurs here. And there's a lot of different moving parts that we can talk about. But I guess the one thing I would ask you is, because I know you you like, obviously, the performance of Majors and bringing him in here. And then, obviously, Victor Timely just being vaporized at the end of this episode. <laughs> well, was, I think... I, I think, I think we, need to quote, we need to quote Cecilia Stokes in the Discord, who I believe said he got par- he got uh, popperdelled, which it oh, was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yes, a nice so- pasta reference for all you ignorant people <laughs> eating elbow macaroni out there. That's a I'm glad someone said it because I absolutely. <laughs> yeah, him, her, uh, Victor and, and Reed Richards are sharing a similar. Ooh, <laughs> They're going to yeah. the same afterlife. I don't know where Italy. I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps, but Maze, you say maybe, and obviously with what we see happen, or at least what we don't see to happen, everybody else at the end, it leaves that question in, in the air. But in terms of leading up to that, with what we saw from Timely here, what did you what did you think of how that all fit in with this episode? 
Man, well, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm just gonna start with where my head's at, which is that he's not dead. There's no chance that Victor Timely's dead. What happened to him is what happened to everybody else, presumably, because it's the temporal radiation that exploded and is now blown through the TVA and presumably eviscerated it, whatever that means. So I don't think we've seen the last of Victor Timely. My initial thoughts when he's volunteering himself to go out there and put on the suit, my head starts thinking, is he about to get supercharged? Is he about to make the leap to becoming Kang or becoming he who remains? Is this in him? Because what this episode did, and you know, we've got the reference, when he meets OB and they're like, I read your notes. No, I read your notes. No, you're the one who came up with No, you're the one who came up with it. And they literally say it's a snake eating his tail, which is an actual Ouroboros. And we've also got Loki realizing that he has to stab himself, like we talked about in the past. So this was a very circular, cyclical episode, right? Where we've got closed loops happening left and right. So it makes sense to me if Victor Timely is fulfilling a closed loop here and he was always supposed to get eviscerated by temporal radiation and that is a necessary step in order to do whatever it is he's supposed to do does that mean he becomes he who remains i guess we'll see there's a lot of variants out there but since the plan was already started by him telling miss minutes to give the book to victor timely that would make sense to me as a beginning of the loop right he knows how that started because he was there so That's where my head's at. As far as like what happens to everybody else, yeah, I'm just as at a loss as the rest of you. It gives them an opportunity to do something really creative here. They and like (laughs) once again, I mean, we kind of felt this way, I think, after season one when they introduced Kang. But it's like, man, there's a lot of pressure on Loki, a Disney Plus series, yeah, to carry the weight of the entire MCU. Like, yeah. They could they could do anything they want out of this reset button that, you know, it's very possible that there's still big MCU fans who aren't watching this show. Yeah. No, I, I mean I could I couldn't agree more. I think in fact, if anything, this show feels like the most direct line to Secret Wars than any any property that we've seen over the past two years. Like it's not even it's not even close. Like I think the next thing that'll be like that is Deadpool three, based off of everything that we've heard about it. But besides that, it there this really is kind of the hub. And when we got the stuff with Ravona and 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 uh, Victor Timely, and then oh hearing about God. the He Who Remains into this episode, not only confirms everything that we discussed in episode one, but also that's the big setup. That is the that is what the entire Kang story is built upon in the comics is the, the everlasting will they, won't they, I hate you. I love you. Kang Ravona thing that can, that continues. And we'll see, and we'll get to Ravona in a second. Cause I do want to talk about, about, uh, Jake, what's her name again? Goo goo. (laughs) (laughs) And she, she was on one. She's been on one these last couple weeks, but Hunter, I want to flip it to you. You've sat with this for a while now with the, with the, with this information. What are you, what is, where's your head at as far as where this series could potentially go or just in general, how this episode played to you and what you've been kind of thinking about over the last couple of weeks? Yeah. I mean, I feel like Anthony brought up a lot of really good points, uh, so I don't want to just, like, repeat those. But I think I just really No, no, hope... no. I got my notes from you, Hunter. No, no. No, 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 no. I got my notes from you. Oh. That's so crazy. Anyway, um, no, I, uh, I think that there's a million different places this could go, and I just really hope it's something clever and entertaining, which, like, that, that is what this show has been thus far. Um, and it's it's like you were just saying, if this show really is a direct line to Secret Wars or the multiverse saga or, you know, whatever this whole grand scheme of things is. Um, and I feel like it has to 
it has to play to that, right? Like I, I it feels like that's where it's going. Um, I agree. I, I obviously I don't think that they're all dead. I mean, it'd be wild if they just killed everyone and then in the next episode they're like, and new variants. We're just gonna focus on them now. Um, but narratively that makes no sense, so they probably won't do that. Um, yeah, I, I think that potentially maybe they just have been like scattered throughout time and space or something like if it's like a temporal radiation right like it's time so mm, well i mean i think in the sense of time is in fact broken just broken just yeah up broken. i guess that's kind of what i mean like if they yeah. get hit by that and like time is broken and we just like don't know what's going on like they're not dead right i don't i don't think that they're dead uh and i don't know that they're just gonna be like still in the tva like part of me feels like something crazy is going on here. Uh, but I just, I, I don't know. I, I truly, I don't know where it's going, but you know, this episode ends on a close up of Loki's face. Um, and I feel like the next episode could not necessarily like begin with a close up of Loki's face, but I feel like if this is like his eyes closing, then the next episode starts with like his eyes opening and we oh, just like kind of lost. Like, what was that? He's going to wake up on the Island and lost. He's going to wake up on the Island and then it's lost. Yeah. Just close <laughs> and then up on the eyeball. If I had yeah. to, if I had to, if I had to take a guess, um, at least for me right now, is I look at this and I see, and I remember the time slipping that was supposed to Ooh. be fixed, and I feel like that story has not ended yet, and I wonder if the temporal radiation will bring that back to a degree where they're kind of where either they or particularly Loki is just slipping all over the place and he's gonna have to find a way to stop it again yeah. in order to kind of reset things or get things back to a place uh where they can at least figure out what's next or and as Mays mentioned earlier with victor timely getting vaporized or in fact getting the same uh type of energy hunter you and i a few weeks ago talked about what happened to kang at the end of ant-man and the wasp of that's true mania and getting charged with a bunch of multiversal energy could perhaps have given him powers otherworldly yeah. other universe like powers. so it, it's maze's point does bring me some uh some pause and some interest on as far as that's concerned but i did want to talk about ravona because i think she's now a a, a very central figure in everything that's going on Jake, I for something that I we did not see on screen, what she does to the rest of those TVA folks was quite frankly horrifying. Yeah, obviously, that I know turned, they weren't going to show it on screen, yeah. but I do kind of not that I want to see that, but like I think that. I was a little bit disappointed that I was watching a Disney property because I'm like, there. Yeah. This idea is so great and horrifying. And like I joked last week that Miss Minutes Wanting a Body should be a movie directed by David Cronenberg, but this really should have been directed by David Cronenberg. Like just these people being turned into fucking goo because they're in like, and once again, there's no, there is no goo. way. Yeah, goo goo. They're turned into goo by goo goo. <laughs> uh, but goo I think by that goo goo is a scent I would wear. Sorry. Goo by goo. Goo goo goo. But I think the the thing that's interesting about her development is I think that the thing to focus on in the early scene is obviously that uh, Kang, they were like in a partnership and he erased her memory, right? And I think the thing that she doesn't have to play, but you can kind of feel is like, she not only took away the fact that she was like close with Kang, had her memory wiped, but oh, she was a general in this war. She was really important. And so she now believes that she has this importance, which she did previously. And so, like, it's I think it's easy to read as, like, oh, she's just a woman scorned. She's mad she got her memory wiped. But she's, I think, also like, and how dare you take away my rightful place as at the top of this? And so, like, I think yeah, that she's... She put the work in. Yeah. And so I think that, like, I almost find it more compelling than if, if it was just oh, she's trying to get back with Kang. It's like, no, 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 she wants to be at the top. If Kang's there, whatever. But, like, she wants to be at the top again. Yes, I I look forward to seeing what happens next with her. It's clear that she's being sent to the Void. And we saw the Void in episode five of last season. So we'll probably, obviously, see that again 
And one has to wonder, is she going to run into Elioth? Who is she going to run into in there? And what is her way back to perhaps? It seems like the my my gut feeling on this is I feel like all of these characters will meet again at the end of time at the Citadel. And yeah. I think we will see another version of Kang. And that's how this season will come to a conclusion and a crescendo there. So I'm, I'm fascinated to see what happens with that. Uh, Maze, what have what have you thought of of Renslayer, her motivations, everything that's gone on with that, and kind of everything that we talked about in episode one coming to fruition here? Miss Minutes has way too much power, man. She can just <laughs> dose everyone at the same time like that. I know that they reboot. One of my favorite little bits of the whole episode was when they rebooted her and she turned into like a outline of an analog clock. That was a great little note. Great I bit. love that. But yeah, I mean, so Renslayer's whole thing is, well, we don't need him then. So I did it. I helped. I was part of it. He just sat here while I managed it. We don't need him. And we can do the same thing that he was doing without him, which I guess is pruning all the shit. I was also bummed out that we didn't see anything with the cube. I felt like once again, we are placing all of the burden of feeling any sort of feelings about loss on Wunmi Mosaku having a reaction to something that we're not going to see. Oh my God, we did it again. But yeah, it's a Disney product. You're not going to see a, a box full of guts or whatever the hell it ends up being. I mean, I just found myself wondering what it was that happened. All you did oh, was all you did box. if you could faintly hear dripping. That's all that that's all that they did. Like literally any anything, guys. I don't know. It it really lost a lot of impact on me because of that. But Sweet. she's so yeah, so she's in the void. Her her motivations are certainly being yanked back and forth from episode to episode i mean in in the world's fair episode she's running errands in episode four she gets told yeah you know he he roofied you and she's like well screw him then not she's not he doesn't even seem mad at him about it she's just like well you, you know whatever he's gone i'm gonna move on and you know she's been kind of hard to pin down i would say for the whole show so now you know, I guess, like, she's the only one that we know for sure where she's at at this point. And that's kind of interesting. So we might start the season or the episode five with her because that's something we actually know is going to happen. But, yeah, like, is she just going to run into all the old Lokis? Is she going to meet other versions of herself? Is she going to hang oh. out with Alligator Loki? What's going to happen? Oh, if he if Alligator Loki shows up, man. Oh, uh, you you know, you got to do it for the I'm, toys, for the I'm merch. Bringing- I am buying those like confetti cannons and I'm putting shoot them off on next episode. <laughs> <laughs> that should be great. That should be great. Hunter, uh, uh, coming off of what, what Jake and May said, like we're Ravona, like obviously from a comic book standpoint, we kind of see, we are now seeing the building of this character to something more substantial than we got in season one. Actually, it surprised me how little they used her in, in season one, but now we're seeing this person come into the light and be a force. Now, where where do you think that where would you like to see them take her character now that it's in this specific place? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question, AC. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, yeah, I think that kind of like you guys were saying, I've been I don't know if like disappointed is the right word, but like she wasn't in season one a lot and. Uh, like Maze was saying, like this season, it's kind of just been like, she just bounces from place to place. And like, I just felt like she seemed, didn't have a lot of characterization compared to a lot of the other characters uh, going on. Um, but I, I think that the reveal that she was a general in this army and that, you know, she was like so close to Kang and she knows this now, um, or he who remains, sorry. Um, I think that this affords a really interesting opportunity to take her character somewhere that I think a lot of people, even people who read comics, like wouldn't be expecting. Like I, I would almost rather her, like, as opposed to just doing the classic, like Ravona thing where, you know, she does end up like teaming up with Kang and then 
they conquer things and then she like half dies and then he's like i gotta get her back and yada 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 like if she almost became a like a competitor like if she was the big threat like if she's the key to eventually taking down kang like i think that that is a lot more interesting and giving her that agency and that goal of her own and and kind of like taking that spite towards him and capitalizing on it would be a lot more interesting to me than just doing what everyone expects her to be um i mean it would be cool like in in the comic she there you know there's like a little bit where she builds herself this super cool futuristic armor and starts calling herself the terminatrix which is like a wild not Excuse that i me? think they're gonna... yep nope you you heard me correct <laughs> there's an x at the end and everything um <laughs> look at jake I don't know. I'm just I'm thinking just like it, heart palpitations right not there. Since, not since you explained Manphibian have I been like, wow, I should have read comics growing up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Between Terminatrix and Miss Minutes, the show has an opportunity to get really insane. But I, uh, yeah, I, I think it would be cool. You know what? Screw it. I hope that she does call herself Terminatrix. I, I hope that that, I hope that, I was about to be like, not that they need to do that, but now I'm like, they need to do that. I think that they should absolutely do that. Um, and it should happen not just here, but throughout all of Secret Wars, and it would be great. Um, but yeah, I that's that's my hope. My hope is that they're just planting a bunch of seeds right now, and those are going to sprout into a really interesting dynamic rivalry between former lovers. I guess yes. is my yes. It's like it's like I, I kind of like see the shape of Kang Dynasty in the in the background in the distance now. As yeah. you kind of see this relationship take place and take form. And it just feels like those variants in all instances are just going to have so many different issues. So I'm, I'm, that part does intrigue me a lot. I'm, I'm very happy that we're finally here with that. Cause then it, it can now we can build off of that story and we'll see how the, the closing two episodes kind of continue to build that in and wrap that portion up and kind of advance it. Can uh, I interject real quick? Yeah, go ahead. All we've seen of He Who Remains in Ravona is that one scene at the beginning of this episode and a audio recording. We Which don't really know that same thing, yeah. We don't really know anything about their relationship. We haven't seen them interact. We haven't seen shit. Like as someone who doesn't read comics, I still don't really get what's going on with them. Yeah. So, they I have think, to do more to establish that. I mm. think of mistake. I if they are planning to play it that not just they were uh, partners in the war, but they actually had like a romantic relationship, I think that that did not come across in the scene we got at the beginning of this episode. And I think that if we're expected to understand that, then they missed. Um, that's my two cents. Well, perhaps like they was, may, Yeah, go I'm ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I felt like they were teasing it in the last episode where they were like kind of flirtatious and Miss Minutes was all like, I, I agree. Really... I agree, but that's but between also, Victor Timley and yeah. her. So yeah, I think that that's all, like, he's a blank slate. He's just a weird nerd yeah. who hasn't ever touched a woman, probably. Because I think that the, the the memory wipe thing I think is different. If well, him wiping the memory of his top general is different than him remembering the what wiping the memory of his lover is that is the thing that I think I would like to see clarified. Yeah, no, that's no, that's fair. Yeah, that, that's interesting, and I do wonder, and I guess we'll kind of find out how it plays out in episode five. Um, when we do catch up with Ravona is what does she do now that she's in the void? Is, does she try to find a way to control Eliath herself? How can she do that? Because what it took just to distract Eliath for Loki and Sylvie to get to the end of the end of time was a lot of magic and, yeah. and uh classic Loki uh, was yeah. erased. So yeah. she's in a different situation. She doesn't have Miss Minutes because Miss Minutes, uh, is now rebooted and and out of here for 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 the time being, so uh, she's in an interesting spot. So how she gets out of the void is, is now is now something to to watch. But Hunter, I, you look like you want to say something. I mean, what if like Quantumanium Kang got sucked into his chair and shot into the void, and then it's just him and Ravona, <laughs> and she's I, like, I wouldn't would, hate that. I would. Yeah, that wouldn't be that would that wouldn't be that wouldn't be terrible. Though I do think I do. Better hope there's not an to... ant variant out there, man. No. <laughs> Dust his ass. <laughs> I I do think that the Quantum Mania Kang 
definitely yeah. we will we won't see him until later at okay. the very least i just yeah. need another aged british character actor to be there you know what i mean like mm. richard e. Grant was just so good and if they could just throw someone else yeah. you know what's your what's your dream casting for aged british character actor uh, aged british character actor give me jared harris i think he's not he's Ooh, probably in his 60s at this point. Yeah, yeah yeah man just running the nuclear power plant see? You see, you didn't think I had an answer off rip, but I did. Oh, I knew you did, Jake. <laughs> okay. I knew who I'm dealing with. Come okay, on. okay, okay. It's, it's just Michael Caine's, like, secret final role. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's like, I, I, it wouldn't be the first time, because remember Robert Redford said that the old man in the gun was going to be his last role, but it actually was uh, Endgame, so. Yeah. Maybe Michael Caine did the same thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, a, a thing that we haven't even had an opportunity to talk about yet is, and I think one of the more... Uh, important things and we can kind of spin a few different ways with this is i thought once again the focus of mobius and his choice to not care about the, his place on the timeline and sylvie pointing that out to him i thought it was interesting that they chose to do that again which makes me think that in the next two episodes we are going to get a look at that uh, at some point um jake i wanted to get your kind of bird's eye view of it as you kind of saw this conversation take place because mobius is like hey we gonna let them dudes work on it let's get some pie let's hang out let's have some more introspective conversations and sylvie's mm -hmm. like i ain't having none of this what, yeah. what did you think of that i think that it is I, I thought it was a very interesting conversation i think then the later conversation with sylvie and loki is interesting because mm -hmm. i think that I think that Sylvie thinks that they have a disagreement in ideology, but I think in reality, it's just a disagreement in temperament that like her life was just so much different than Loki's and then Mobius's where she spent her whole life on the run. She is filled with resentment that she's very emotional. She's very led by emotion. And I don't say that derisively. It's just like, clearly she's impulsive. She killed he remains. Um, and I think that she confuses uh, Mobius's pragmatism for naivete and I think he might be a little bit naive, but I think that she is trying to that she's trying to make sense of what his decision based on the framework of how she th sees things. And he is coming from a place of like, this is my task now. I don't have any attachment to my previous life. I don't know what it was, and it's not worth introducing it. And she, of course, having just le lived a life in Oklahoma on the timeline, is like, why would you not want that? And so it they're kind of talking past each other because they're not really having there's nothing that she could say that would convince him to go and there's nothing he could say that could convince her so they're really just compl they'll never see eye eye on this well i thought what was interesting was i think mobius's response to it was just the facial expressions mm -hmm. and he was just like almost like miffed that she would bring it up it's like what is she talking wow about? <laughs> <laughs> that will never not get me that, that... <laughs> That's a banger every time. <laughs> I should have known that was coming. But yeah, that part, that part of it, you know, watching that play out, I I now have had like a semi a semi obsessive thought about like, hey, I want to see what Mobius's life is like. And I feel like when we find that out, it's probably going to be something either heartbreaking or something like or something shocking that we wouldn't have expected from him. Maze, when you see when you see Mobius in this situation and kind of how, to a degree, it does make sense for Sylvie to look at this situation and be like, and I know Jake talked about the emotion aspect of it, but just generally speaking, I mean, if you think about it logically, wouldn't you want to know? Wouldn't you want to have an idea? And the fact that he doesn't is, it, at least it like, it raises the thought, it raises the question, but what are your thoughts on it? I mean, I don't feel like it, anything, any new ground was broken in this episode. I feel like we really mm -hmm. covered it. I guess it would be episode two where he said, I, I don't want it to be good. If it was good, that would be the right. worst thing. Um, I Like this episode for Mobius felt incredibly forgettable. Uh, the the thing that you guys kind of touched on was the, the scene in the automat with the pie room with Sylvie and Loki. I thought that was a really important conversation for the scope of the show and i love the the capper of we are gods and i just want to i want to this popped into my head i need to ask the question before i forget yeah, it go. what the hell was going on with the hot chocolate scene <laughs> the, I, so, so victor oh, oh. timely yeah. sees a hot chocolate he's like whoa what the fuck 
Y'all got hot chocolate machines? And Moby's like, yeah. Yeah, dog. It's the TVA. Uh, we got all kinds of shit. And then he's like, where? I want it. Give it to me. Then he goes. So I'm like, okay, cool. He's just fascinated by the machine. He wants to get a hot chocolate. He gets the it. hot chocolate. And then he doesn't try the hot chocolate. <laughs> he makes he makes the hunter drink the hot chocolate. And the hunter's like, mm, yeah, pretty good. And then he gets, you know, he hmm. gets pruned. So, like, I get that it was all a setup to, like, get him out of the room or whatever. But I need to know what was going on in Victor Timely's yeah. head to go get the hot chocolate, but not to try the hot chocolate. I don't know what he's doing. I I will say, too, I was less frustrated with Majors' acting in this, except when he did the hot cocoa line. Like, he was like, hot cocoa, 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 cocoa. I'm, I'm feeling incredibly like validated first... right now because these are the exact same thoughts that I had both times I watched it. <laughs> I was confused. Not trying to make fun of people with stutters. Like, spent, genuinely, no, but I, it's not even that. They just was like, on it. it you was know what, so... what Miss Minutes was glitching? And he's like, that's not very nice. <laughs> yeah, that was You didn't know that Majors was, was thinking. No, he was no, like, no, Coco no, is a word that you already say, like, the twice. same thing twice in a row. Oh, and he's like, I got God. a gold mine yeah, here. I, uh, like, Maze, when you said that, like, is Victor Tommy, is he going to end up be and turning out to be he remains? I'm like, well, one, he's got to get some just for men and he's got to get Jeffrey Rush from the King speech, because mm. if not, he's not the he remains mm. or some or some temporal radiation, you know, we'll clear all that up. In one yeah, go. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I, like someone give me an answer. What the fuck was he thinking? There isn't one. I saw it twice. And but like the second time I was like, I'm going to pick up on something. That is gonna like figure it out for, and I didn't. I didn't. I don't. I don't understand. I think they were just trying, like, from a and narrative from the writer's the perspective, they're like yeah. it'll endear the audience to him because look how cute it is. And, and I'm like, but no. I think what it what it, it what it eventually felt like if if he didn't leave the room for it. What I thought it was trying to underline, which I think is an interesting idea, is that it's. It's one thing to take a person from the year 2023 and bring them to the TVA, and they'll be amazed by the time shit. But bringing a person from, like, the 1890s there, he would be interested in something that was built in, like, the 1940s, right? And so I yeah. think that, like, that is a – if he didn't leave the room, it's like that is actually a really cool like, underlining that this guy is a rube beyond just not understanding time travel. He is amazed by the idea of a hot cocoa machine. Sure. But then when they made him leave the room, then I'm like – then – then it did just feel like a plot function in an episode that didn't feel like it had a lot of those. But he's not but looking I, I, at the machine and he's not tasting the fucking cocoa. I thought, was he like testing to see if it was poison? Like, what the <laughs> fuck is he thinking? Yeah, I, don't I, know. Know that, I know it's incredibly unimportant. In no, episode, it's important of now. Epic proportions. It it's is. such a red flag. It's distracting enough that it's important now. <laughs> so I think. It's fair to question and ask after we what we saw last episode. Is this a case of where Majors went to um, Eric Martin and the directors and was like, hey, can I kind of like riff on this a little bit? Can I put my own pepper, my, my own salt and pepper on this joint? And to be quite honest, it's not something that because um, I mean, as we discussed last week, uh, the, the stuttering thing was not really necessary. And I don't know a lot of folks were like, oh, yeah, this thing was kind of, he, he was kind of acting his ass off. Yeah. Which I get to a degree, but at the same time, it's not adding anything to yeah. what is what is happening yeah. currently. I disagree. The- I disagree. But I also did think uh-huh. conning people. So I thought it was part of the con. And yeah. then he, he just kept it. So yeah. It like, yeah. Yeah. If he was just stuttering on stage, that's right. a great choice. Right. But right, right. It, yeah, it, it yeah. felt like I think what I said last week, and I just want to reiterate it, is that mm-hmm. like what it feels like he is doing is that the his performance feels like he's putting too fine a point on this version of Kang being harmless, and the stutter is one too many things. Yeah, mm. I just really love the idea of them being on set, and they're like, "All right, Jonathan, and now you drink the hot cocoa," and he's like, "No, Four. <laughs> no, the like, hot, like, mm, hot cocoa." That's why the way let me it. act. All right. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 yeah. I mean, it's a fair. No, nah, it's fair. Like, it's fair. I, to, I, I totally get it. I totally get it, man. But um, uh, Maze, sorry, you, I derailed. Let's go back to. No, let's go back to you're Mobius. Good. You're good. Mobius. The amount of times you've been on the show, it is an insult to think that we have rails anywhere in the vicinity of it. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's I fair. mean, listen, I try and color inside the lines, but I realized a, <laughs> a long time ago that a lot of that. Happened. Wow. So, <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> it's, it's totally understandable, man. Um, but Maze, you you did mention the Loki Sylvie conversation, which was an instructive one on where they both stand. I think the defining moment for for Loki, obviously in season one, is what happens to him at the at the end with Sylvie and how that relationship changes. Over this season so far, I think the one thing that we've seen from Loki is his that hero turn while adding a little bit of the the mischief and and using more of his powers as i was reading a thr article eric martin talked about how they wanted to make loki's powers a little bit more wanted to put that a little bit more in this season the hero turn here with a mix of like hey this is the greater good and i thought that little story that he mentioned about about thor uh coming back to coming back to him in Asgard, I thought was a very instructive how this Loki kind of sees things now as opposed to what he saw before. So uh, Jake, I'll ask you a- about this conversation because I thought it was, it, it, Maze makes, makes a great point because it is an instructive one on where they both yeah. stand at this point. And I feel like this kind of solidifies this new Loki as mm-hmm. to me, like a, a, a real, like actual hero. Yeah, I think it does. And I think that the hero turn makes sense when you think about why Loki was a villain to begin with. Because I think that he wanted things, but he was never a nihilist. Like, he never he never had a goal that was to burn anything all down. Like, he was kind of motivated by his own wants and desires. And I think what happened to him, which I think is a fair way to give someone a hero turn, is when he, one, saw what was at the root of his problems and the enormity of this whole, the TVA and all this. Like, he was a good enough person underneath to realize like, oh, this is bigger than me wanting to get my brother's approval. Like this is, and I think that Sylvie, on the other hand, is is very nihilistic. That she doesn't see, and, and everyone's like talking about her background, you would understand why she doesn't, isn't concerned with other people, isn't concerned with the well-being of, you know, the greater good, etc. And I think that, he comes at it from a very practical sort of way of like, you know, and it, 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 the reason it works for me is because the thing that motivates him to want to fix the TVA is because on some level he believes that it is his responsibility to be powerful. So it is kind of from the same place that makes him bad. You know, yeah. the fact that he thinks that he is powerful enough to make these decisions is not exactly a, a completely positive quality. It's what makes it interesting is that he's able to, say like we are gods that like someone basically what he's saying is it's a dirty job but someone's got to do it you know and so and she is like well then no one should do it it's no one's job and i think that both of them make points i think that it's it, it was an interesting philosophical conversation i think ultimately i don't know who's going to be right because it actually it does depend on how the time how everything actually works like what actually happens if there's no tva right. um but i think that like the thing that made the conversation work for me is that it felt completely true to the characters. Loki felt like he was Loki. Sylvie felt like he, she was Sylvie. Um, it didn't feel like they were rushing character development to make conflict or anything like that. Yes, yes. Uh, Hunter, hope is hard. What did you think of that line? That's a that's a that's a real that's a real zinger of a line. I like that line. Hope is hard. What did you think of that whole? Because when he talks about the idea of well, when things are in disarray, it's easy to just let go. It's easy to just do the opposite thing. It's a conversation that comes up in life all the time. It's easy to be this be this person as opposed to doing the right thing and doing the well and good and just thing. Well, that kind of really like hit it home for me and cemented that that hero's journey that we we've, mm-hmm. we've been seeing from Loki. What did you think of that aspect of it as like the he says it with such a confidence, which is something that if you go back to the beginning of this series, it's like it's really kind of a hell of a turn yeah. that we've seen throughout develop, which is funny because in retrospect, when you talk about Loki from the, you know, going to Infinity War, he found his way there anyway, which always which makes you always think like, oh, this dude might have been good the entire time. And it was just kind of like just within him and he found a different way to get there. But give me your thoughts. 
Yeah, no. Um, I think that whole conversation, I'm glad you brought up the hope thing, actually, because that that really hit for me as well. Um, and I, I think that it, it's beautiful and that that like Loki used to be the person who would just like, you know, scorch earth to get what he wants and like not really care. But what Loki has always really wanted just is a family. Like he just wants to be accepted. That's, that's all he's ever wanted. And it's like Jake was saying, like that is, that's what his whole villain thing was. Is he, he was convinced that he wasn't someone who could be loved or who was like allowed a place, you know, he was like the adopted kid. He was the, the bastard child was sort of the vibe. Right. So he has just spent his entire existence trying to prove that that's not the case and that he does have some sort of purpose and that some glorious purpose, right. That like, that he, thank you, Jake. Uh, and that he is, that he, he means something and that he matters. Um, and I, and that's incredibly relatable, right. That's what everyone wants really. Um, and he used to feel like, you know, he had to throw the temper tantrums to get that, to get that acknowledgement he had to prove to everyone that he could do it. And he had to tear down New York City. He had to not care about the civilians uh, because no one was ever going to love them. So God damn it, he's going to make them bow. But now he's been through this experience where he does kind of feel that love. I mean, some of it is to Sylvie, who is himself, which is, you know, it like I, I, that could, is a whole other commentary. But like... <laughs> I, th I think that he's found some semblance of family. He's found people who believe in him for his abilities and for who he is. And it's, it's like, it's like he took a really nice nap. Like, like when you have a long day and you're going about like, you're by yourself, like all these crazy things happen on the New York city subway. Like someone spits on your food, everything goes wrong. And by the time you get home, you're like, I hate everything. Like, I hope you know, that no, guy who That's pushed real. me down the street trips or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then you take like a good nap and you spend some time with like someone who loves you. You call your mom, hang out with your roommate, whatever. And then all of a sudden you're like, man, this world is kind of beautiful, huh? Like the sun's rising. The sky's gorgeous. I want to keep doing this. This is great. And I feel like that's kind of what he has been doing for these two seasons. Like he took that long nap. He, he metaphorically called, his mom mobius i don't know but he just had that experience and now the sky's a little more blue and he understands what it he i think he understands what he had wanted like better than he had prior um so now he does want to preserve it he does understand where he was wrong in the past and what he wants going forward um and and i think that's beautiful and i think that he desperately wants sylvie to have that same realization mm -hmm. but he just like can't get there because her trauma is just a little bit different than his. And there's just, you know, she's different. So he's got to work through that. But for me, that conversation is him being like, we do have a glorious purpose. Like, just just take that nap, call your mom, like smell the roses. And you're going to want to you're going to want to defend all of it. And I and he boils all that down to hope. Like it's it's so much harder to want to live it's so much harder to want to keep pushing and to want to save people but at the end of the day like that is fulfilling him more than throwing temper tantrums ever did and he just wants that for sylvie so bad and it's beautiful but yeah my good my goodness hunter you just i, I wow. just want to put the, the yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly i want to put the more you know at the end of that uh, at the end of that uh oh, that's not in my soundboard yet i mean uh, uh, you see but <laughs> <laughs> not again not again <laughs> It's it's all good, but that was wonderful, man. I I appreciate that. Uh, Maze, as you recover from not having that sound, um, <laughs> I want to want to take Sylvie's side of it here. What, what did you think of her? Because she is just like she just doesn't believe in any of this. She does. She just feels like this is not something that anybody should be taking a uh, part of. As she just doesn't trust anybody, which I can understand, but. Now, as we get to critical mass and, and a critical point of the series, where do you see her her point of view as this this series continues to build into something uh, different? Are we are we still talking to me? Oh no, no, no I was, was, was pointing towards me. me. I mean, oh, okay, great. <laughs> I th she's she's been tough this season, man, because yeah. I wasn't buying the Oklahoma shit, and then she's essentially been our antagonist 
this season because yeah. she's trying to stop them from fixing things because she disagrees with it. And then she has the opportunity to end it and kill Timely last episode. And she explains that in this episode by saying, he seems scared. And he who remains wasn't scared. And that's not good enough for me. That's not an explanation for you to turn on a dime and, you know, flinch, essentially, here. So, you know, I, we talked about how Renslayer, or I talked about how I didn't think really Renslayer, we have a character path for her. I don't feel like I really know what she's up to. Sylvia, I feel like, has been done a disservice this season as well. I agree. I, I think I think what Hunter just went into from Loki's perspective of trying to relate to her about it is actually really on point. But in terms of what she, like she just is lashing out kind of impulsively and only to fit the purposes of the narrative. We need someone to try to stop this from happening. Uh, it's going to be Sylvie. Uh, we need somebody to, you know, get close to disrupting everything, but then not do it. It's going to be Sylvie. So, you know. Heading into the the great reset button or whatever the hell just happened at the end of this episode, I'm not sure where she's at. Um, I I think that maybe this will take the weight off of her shoulders a little bit because mm -hmm. theoretically this is what she's been after. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. But yeah, I, I don't really have a strong pulse on what she's about right now. Yeah, and I think the thing that it doesn't what makes it not work and what makes it feel impulsive is that her response to Loki and Mobius and everyone being like, if we don't save the TVA, it will be a disaster. She doesn't have a argument other than this. No, -uh. yeah. like she needs something more than that. Like, what is she? Th I, I mean, essentially, what does she think is going to happen if the TVA goes away? If her answer is then everyone will be fine and dandy. Like that is an answer. And she can believe that because we actually don't know if that's the case. But the fact that like she, doesn't rebut it. So what it makes it feel like is that she is trying for the, that she's okay with all the disaster they're describing, but that can't be true because that would mean that the timeline she was on would go away. And so like, what is she actually doing? And so I think that if there was a clear difference in opinion of her saying, no, he who remains was lying every timeline can coexist. Believe me, that is one thing, but I think that that is, I think she needs to say and it, like I said, it's unclear because it if, if, if she accepts the idea mm -hmm. that if the loom explodes, all the timelines will go away, there's no reason she would want to kill Victor Timely in the first place. And so clearly she doesn't. But then in that case, does she have any opinion? Does she have any thoughts about it? And I don't know. It feels like they're kind of just, yeah, I think we're just led to believe that she's acting nothing but on impulse. But that's not the character we saw in season one. You know, off of the... Off of the decision to kill He Who Remains last season, I thought that they would take uh, a little bit more of an expansive look at what that decision meant for her. And it does feel like they've kind of just undercooked that. And just like, it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not like Loki where it has continued to kind of the journey has made him an added like, little notches on his belt that you can see and that he exudes in the way that he talks and not only with her but with everybody and in his character and that part with sylvie just i, I wish because i do think that, it's like i think of the third episode of the first season and when they were able to have that really long conversation and i know a lot of people you know were up in the air on that por on that portion of it but I just like the fact that we got to know her and kind of know where she stood on things and why she, where we get to the end of, of season one and she, and there's a reason that she makes that decision to kill he who remains. And then off of that, I think you would have had, you should have had the opportunity to build upon that and make that story grander and uh, more meaningful. And it just hasn't been that, which, is, and you know, unfortunately it's fall. It's one of the things of the show that, that has fallen flat, but you know, we'll have to see what the, what it brings for the two of them as far as their relationship is concerned in the next two episodes, because uh, I'm curious to see how they want to try and 
continue it with the with the two of them or is there going to be a breaking apart at some point how is does that go i'm not sure because it's because as you guys said sylvie is in a strange place so as you know as far as now where we're headed we kind of have a, a grand look at things um but actually you know what before i get to that i maze i wanted to ask you what did you think of of your guy uh mr casal in this episode as uh he was pretty good he had a he had a couple good moments there um i did think it was pretty dumb how ren slayer and miss minute showed up and said anyone who wants to join the team and he's the only one and then they and then he you know runs one errand for them and like it was so bizarre it was like okay we're really stretching to give the other name in the cast something to do this episode but before that he had like his puppy dog look when they're when they're like you could get your life back brad and he's like i want to be a movie star so bad i mean you know good good for you brad shoot your shot and all that but i mean he did he did all right he it wasn't a great it wasn't a great written role for him but i think he's been good in this show still it, it 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 does make me wonder um the fact that they've continued to use him up to this point it, it does feel like he does have a role to play in the final two episodes what that is that remains to be seen i'm not sure but i do but uh, as i was saying before i did want to get to kind of like where this points now now that we are in uncharted territory um jake i'll start with you where do you want not necessarily like you don't have to have like a story choice mm-hmm. or, or something along those lines, but what interests you the most about where this can go? What does it mean for the loom to be broken? Is it is does it mean nothing? Is was the TVA nothing but a p- means of control, or is it actually disastrous for the timelines if there's no loom? I think that that needs to have a definitive answer uh, because I think that like I was saying, the whole ideological divide between Sylvie and Loki is based on that, and so I'm fascinated to see where they end up. And what it looks like. And obviously one of the things we know is going to happen is that there's going to be a lot of Kangs. But we also don't know from like a literal perspective, like, can, will there be incursions? You know, the, the I word that you've been using on the spot for four years. You know, we really haven't seen a major one. And mm-hmm. so I want, I want there to be, I like the idea that the loom breaking doesn't kill them all. But I also need there to be good consequences. Yes, and Eric Martin did allude to that in the, the THR article. He did mention that trust that there will be consequences for what happened. So that should be interesting to see. Hunter, I uh, want to get your thoughts on like what what interests you about this going forward now that you're in a place where it's like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. The, this could go anywhere. Well, what, what are your, what are your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, well... We just spent a lot of time talking about, like, character development and, like, lack thereof and where it is, where it isn't. Um, And I I think that they have given themselves a really unique way to develop these characters going forward. Um, And I just really need the show to capitalize on that. Like, I I don't want it to be a situation where there's, like, this crazy cool cliffhanger ending and then in the next episode they're like, oh my gosh, we got hit by the temporal radiation and like nothing happened and we're just going to keep moving forward and like nothing, like I do, like Jake said, like I want there to be consequences, um, but I want the last two episodes of this show to feel like the last two episodes. Like I don't want it to be all set up. Like I want these characters to go somewhere. Um, We don't know if there's going to be a season three of this and I don't want this to feel like a lot of the other uh, Disney Plus shows where it, it kind of ends, but it doesn't really end. And you're like, okay, I have this mini series with a beginning, a middle, and then an ellipses. Like, I don't, I don't want that. So I, I just, I think that they've put themselves in a position to do something really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and to do it in a way that really brings these characters, characters, uh, full circle. And I just, I, I want that. Like, that's really all I need to be satisfied. I don't have a strong opinion on like what kind of, how this should play out per se i just i want it to be emotionally satisfying at the end and that's and i think that they can do it in a way that we haven't seen before and that's that's what i want and maze i'll ask you the same question how where where are you standing on what you want to see i mean i feel like they put a lot of pressure on themselves actually i think it's a holy shit moment and that's cool and all and you get the big explosive finish 
why isn't this button playing anymore? I need my horny noise to play. It's not playing, so I'm just going to play own instead. But (laughs) now the pressure's on because they have to... They have to do what you guys are alluding to, but they also can't separate the characters. Like they have to have the characters together. Otherwise you don't have the show. And if they really wiped out the TVA, then they've wiped out all of their sets and all of their production design. And a lot of what made the show really cool. So now it's like, are they dropped in the real world? Are they dropped in, the void are they dropped in you know the the volume green screen spectacular like wh- what are know. we doing now please because because <laughs> that has not been working for them lately like no. quantum mania one of the biggest problems i mean it, it didn't k- kill me but i know a lot of people were not pleased with just like oh the look over there it's a big eyeball ah, you know like that wasn't working for people so no i th- I think the pressure is on i think the stakes have been raised i think they made a big move they went all in and now they have to deliver and mm-hmm. you know i do i have faith in them to do that i think so i'm intrigued i want to see it but you know i think already some of the things you mentioned ac like uh being unstuck in time again or what was it time jumping time slipping i'm slipping i don't think they can do that i don't think they can have everybody time slipping all over the place i think that would be like chaotic and they'd have to like i don't know how they would regulate it without a tva to like get the equipment in because i think the one thing that we can assume is that the tva and all of its powers are gone so the temp pads are done miss minutes is probably done uh you know the loom is probably destroyed like things like that are probably off the table. And so what I think is going to happen, and you know, I kind of alluded to it with my Victor Timely theory, is like, this seems like we are going back to the beginning and we're going to see them build the TVA again. And how do they do that? OB and Victor Timely are going to do it. That would be my guess. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. I have... I have wondered because we saw the double Loki thing in episode four um, in this past episode. And the fact that in previous trailers, now they don't always come to fruition in previous trailers. There are other scenes with Loki seeing another Loki, um, him reading the TVA book, one catching the other one reading the TVA book. Is there going to be something like that now that time is broken? Is that is that going to be just kind of like, is, does that occur with not only him, but other characters? Are we revisiting certain moments that have happened in the show already, even going back to season one? Um, those are the things that run through my mind when we talk about time being broken. So that is kind of what I am curious to see if they get to that point and how they resolve this issue. And I think, really bottom line is the fact that we haven't that we need to kind of see more of the the kang aspect of this and how this fits in because to this point the argument can easily be be made that we haven't gotten enough of that story especially if it's supposed to be the main one and if it's supposed to be the main one then we need to get more as you mentioned with ravona and that relationship and everything that's going on there so those are the types of things that I need to see resolved. And I hope that, and I think Jake's point was very frank and very good. Um, yeah, there needs to be consequences. I, there needs to be consequences for this thing breaking. This is what you built the four episodes up to, and they failed. And clearly something bad happened. And what is what are the results of that? And how, and is it something um you know something that's that you can't come back from and if you can't come back from that what does that mean for the entire thing or is this contained to just the tva it yeah. can't be like that considering everything that this is supposed to be building to and of course this is the thing that we always get into is when you have this interconnected universe and you're trying to build towards something it's always difficult to land a plane as far as the series is concerned without having to tell the story to for the next thing so that balance 
is something that is going to be very tricky. And yes, they they hit us with a with a nice right hand here to end episode four, but now you have two episodes to kind of kind of get us to a place where there is satisfaction. Now, do I think that the writers on this show kind of have a good idea of what they want to do? Yes. I, th- I do think it's not like what we've seen in other Disney Plus shows. However, at the same time, there have been some issues in this series, as we mentioned with Sylvie and some of the things that have been undercooked as far as those things are concerned. So I'm I'm intri- I'm intrigued. I'm curious. I've been entertained so far at, at that minimum. But Maze, it seems like you have something. Yeah, I, I, I just want to dig into what Jake means by consequences. Like when you say consequences, do you mean for the entire MCU? No, I I mean pos- like what I mean is that like what uh, there needs to be a market difference of like what what happens to all the timelines like are they all just okay is it like I actually would even accept if Sylvie was right and that they didn't need to exist at all but like there needs to be a difference in what the multiverse looks like if the TVA doesn't exist you know what I mean like are there tons of incursions is there a ton like what is the- well can we can we assume that the temporal loom was built by He Who Remains to yes. keep tabs on the other Kangs. I think in some way, yes. So that's really it. Like, that's, like, more than and, anything else, that's what it's holding in check. And I think in that case, then I think we need to see some immediate, in this series, not, Kangage. I don't want to have to wait for another movie to see what the actual consequences are. Because I think that, like, I think that the whole the, the show is kind of predicated on this idea that the TVA is obviously evil. The TVA does really bad things. Is it a necessary evil? And I think that this is the put up or shut up moment of where they need to answer that question. And because the the season one finale was a cliffhanger where that answer was like was directly put in the audience. One character said yes. One character said no. Yeah. But and that just held it off. But we need to answer the question. We need to know what actually is this doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I no. I I couldn't agree more. I think. There are questions that need to be answered, and also, I, I mean, just looking at the looking at the the grand scheme of things, because you, in a, in a way, you have to. There's really, like I had said earlier, Deadpool three is really the only thing that kind of like has like a direct connection to this in any way, because Deadpool is using TVA agents and stuff like that. So clearly, if that's happening, that means the TVA to a degree still exists. So what, where, how do we get there? is is a a point of contention that we will have to see happen and um yeah we'll 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 also see with the way that the marvels um is set up in its story with the with the three characters kind of interchanging every time they use their powers is also something to watch as well but that remains to be seen uh the heart of the tva interesting episode we'll see what happens next week should be fascinating want to thank our guests for joining us uh, first, uh, Anthony Mays, aka Corn Puzzle. Uh, tell us where we can find you and find your work uh, on on the old Cinephobe. Yeah, find me on Twitter, Instagram at Corn Puzzle. We've got a new CT five that Cinephobe Top Five episode coming out on Monday. It's about and twin. <laughs> That's right. Top five twins comes out on uh, Monday. <laughs> did um did me and my twin brother Michael make it by any chance? Were you in a cinephobe movie, Jake? No, unfortunately, we weren't. No. Yeah, sorry, uh, you're number one in my heart. Thank you. One of my favorite jokes that no one ever laughs at, really, but I have to say it because I, I someone watching doesn't laugh is I whenever someone says like that they're twinning when they dress the same. I like to pretend like I'm a very angry person on Twitter and saying, "Hey, we are not your costume." Nice, anyway. nice, yeah. Because <laughs> you, you and your twin brother don't dress the same, right? No, we don't, and we also are fr- very much fraternal uh-huh. in that we don't look almost anything alike. <laughs> Great stuff. Make sure you listen to Cinephobe, which, by the way, reached its 200th episode. Yeah. Congratulations, 200, baby. 200, 200, 200 years. years. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's a podcast worth your time hey like hey that. drake i have a question drake would you say that uh combination damn it i was gonna ask you do a me a mean and uh zach make it good and i was gonna set that up but <laughs> <laughs>
Never mind. Oh, yes. man. Bingo. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. Appreciate you, Maze. And, and Hunter Radici, sir, um, let us know where we can find your work, where we can follow you. You've been all over the place, a little Comic Con, a little mm-hmm. film film festival, You're doing a lot of stuff. What's happening, man? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of n- nerdalist things uh, lately, right? Call full circle, yeah. said that at the beginning, saying it at the end, back to that what cyclical that uh, commentary, wow. right? Uh, <laughs> I do what I can, folks. Um, yeah, I I am HRDC14 on everything. Um, that's H-R-A-D-E-S-I and then the number 14. Um, I write for a website currently called The Streamer. Um, that is Streamer without the second E because we are both cool and hip. Uh, yeah, so my, my work is all there. I've been doing some stuff for Cinelinks too. So uh, if you guys want to check that website out, uh, you can see some of my writing. Like AC just said, it's been a crazy month. I was doing uh, New York Film Festival and New York Comic Con at the same time, uh, running back and forth between Lincoln Center and Javits Center was real fun uh brisk 20 minute speed walk between the two buildings yeah. um so i thankfully, have a ton I of... say, thankfully they're not that far like yeah, obviously they're not, annoying, that far. But they're not that far <laughs> and there's a couple solid food trucks between them so like yeah. you know i <laughs> yeah, they were, they were, comic con really they were out there they were really out there this time yeah those yeah, food trucks right, are yeah. everywhere they're not bad they're not bad and it's a lot cheaper than most of the food inside so <laughs> works yeah. for me yeah. um but yeah, I have a lot of movie reviews uh, from the last couple weeks. I got a few coming up. Um, I'll be seeing the Marvels soon at an unspecified time and location. Um, uh, I'm seeing the new Hunger Games soonish, so uh, look out for thoughts on those. Um, yeah, I'm working on just just follow me because I po- I post about this stuff all the mm-hmm. time. I'm working on uh, my first attempt at a documentary right now, so I'm I'm working on trying to get like a little teaser trailer out for that. So keep eyes peeled for that. Uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm all over the place. I, I'm kind of throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and hoping some of it sticks. So someone someone who's listening, make it stick. Give it a listen. Enjoy it. <laughs> that's that's how you do it. Appreciate you for joining. And, and also, I will say this one thing to you, Hunter. Oh, boy. I was about to say your bills were looking shaky until last night. That's a, a decent performance. You trust oh, the process, uh, AC. You trust the process. Yeah, we're, we're we're right on your tail. I, I mean the um, the, the I Zach mean the dolphins Wilson, are right on Zach our tail. Wilson I'm not really Matt. sure about you guys. <laughs> AC, AC, I just the make... Zach Wilson led Jets, baby. Unbelievable. <laughs> now you're just embarrassing yourself. I, yeah, I don't know what's happening right now. Should I hang up? <laughs> <laughs> AC, I can't, oh I can't God. co-sign they're, this. I don't know what, where your optimism about totally, the Jets season is coming to, from. They're, they're totally going to lose to the Giants this weekend. Yeah, I see it. yeah, I, I see it. They're, they're totally going to lose to them. Yeah, no, I don't know why it's, I went there. It's uh, it's go, go Bill till I die. Mafia yes. means family. Nowhere else I'd rather be. I, mm. I'm with it. I've listened. I lived through the drought. I've. We're here. We out here. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you, man. And Jake Christie, where can we find you, sir? You can follow me on Twitter at the Jake Christie. Listen to my other podcast, Love at First Psych, where me and Andre Burr are talking about the USA Network series Psych. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, and uh, please listen to this show. You know, uh, I mean, you already yes. are. So, well, <laughs> yes, that, <laughs> like that, a that snake one. eating its own tail. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And of, and of course, finally. You can follow me on the Twitter at Anthony Canton underscore three. Follow the show on all platforms at MC University Pod. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check out the Patreon, as I mentioned. Uh, five star review, Spotify, Apple, all them places if you can. Appreciate everybody for listening. Appreciate everybody for supporting for Hunter Radici and Anthony Mays and Jake Christie. I'm Anthony Canton the third. This has been Marvel Cinematic University, and we will talk to you next time.